The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Welcome today. We've got a really, really special treat for you today. Film director, writer, George Gallo is also a brilliant painter. As a matter of fact, he studied in the lineage of the Pennsylvania Impressionist. You're going to love this video, Impressionistic Landscape Painting. Hi, my name is George Gallo and I'm going to teach you how to paint a landscape painting, uh, a beautiful scene in uh, southern New Jersey, a beautiful stream with trees, you're going to love it. It's one of my favorite places to paint. And we're going to work pretty much at the same pace that we do uh, when we're outside. I might move a little more slowly, a little more thoughtfully to explain what I'm doing. Also part of the process, I think what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, I'm going to try to get you guys to think like a painter, think like a painter. And what I mean by that is, is to, how to transform what you're seeing and break it down into paint. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a blast. I kind of can't wait to get started. Okay, before we get started, let me show you all about the materials and how they work and how they all interact with one another. Okay, so let me sp explain the palette and how it works. It's a palette that, uh, it's a pure color palette. I don't use any earth tones. Um, I have brown over here just sort of as a backup, but it's a pure color palette. Uh, I, I basically use, uh, it, it's the interaction of purple, green, and orange, which are your three secondary colors. Um, here we have ivory black, which is great for grays and for knocking down, uh, you know, uh, so let's say when, you, when, when the colors get a little too intense, sometimes I'll introduce a little bit of black. Um, some people say that's a no-no, but John Singer Sargent used black and he knew a thing or two. Uh, next one is French ultramarine blue or ultramarine blue, which is a blue with some red in it. That's important because that creates uh, the cleanest and purest of purples. When mixed with alizarin crimson, which is a red with blue in it. All right, next up is uh, Cadmium Red Deep, which is a, a dark red, but it, it's a red with some yellow in it. And I'll explain why this is all very important. Then orange is the modifier of the palette, Cadmium Orange. Next one up, Cadmium Yellow Deep. That is a yellow with a lot of red in it. And that's very, very important because as we move towards the greens, red becomes the modifier of green. The next one up is Cadmium Lemon Yellow, which is the brightest of all yellows, but it's also the coolest of all yellows. It has some blue in it which is important because if you want to make a pure green, you need blue, and red is a modifier. Red will knock it down. Blue will make it stronger. The next one up is uh, Thalo Blue, which is a blue with some yellow in it. And then the other colors I have are more specialty colors. I have uh, King's Blue Light, which is essentially, uh, these you don't really need, but I'm using them for this painting. King's Blue Light is, uh, is basically ultramarine blue with white is all it is. The next one, I have, I have some transparent oxide brown, which is a, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transparent brown. I have uh, white, titanium white, and then I have a little cobalt violet. And the reason I have cobalt violet is because there are some pure violet uh, notes in this picture. And I have noticed over time that if I mix the violet with ultramarine blue and alizarin and white and I go too bright, it, they start to basically gray out over time. 
So uh, the cobalt violet is very light fast, it'll last forever. Um, the, the importance of the palette is I, I'm, I am astonished by how many painters, and I mean great artists, who don't sometimes understand the interaction of, how, of colors and how secondary colors uh, all affect one another. Um, they did lots of experiments with people where they put people in red rooms that had no other colors in them and people came out of the room and they thought that the room was, was gray. And once they introduced like a green plant or a green vase, people would say, oh, the room was red. And they could only tell that because of the interaction of the green and the red, which are opposites on the color scale. So uh, there's some, uh, some people don't uh, believe what I'm about to tell you, but the color wheel, in my opinion, is the basis of all painting. It's the same thing as like, to say that the color wheel has nothing to do with painting is to say like notes have nothing to do with music. It is about the interaction of all of these colors. And I guess that pretty much explains the palette. I'll explain it as I go through, and I guess I'll get started painting now. All right, now before we start, I know I said we were going to start, but just give me one more minute. Before we start, let me tell you a little bit about this image here. Uh, this image is of a place in southern New Jersey. It's a, a place very near and dear to my heart. The stream I used to paint that, uh, you know, when I was 18 years old, and um, and, I'm like, and I didn't know what I was doing then. But anyway, made, made a lot of messes out there, so I'm going to try to get even with it today. But um, you can see, uh, primarily, I ask myself a lot of questions before I start. The first thing I'm going to ask myself is, what is the temperature of the light? Is the light warm? Is the light cool? Because if the light is warm, it will produce generally, you know, generally, you know, as I, you know, don't because there can be exceptions, but as a general rule, warm light will produce cool shadows, as, uh, and also cool light will produce warm shadows. So here you almost have a little bit of both, which will make for a spectacular painting, but also perhaps a little difficult to pull off. You'll notice that these shadows in here are very, very warm, and that's because of this cool light coming in through here. That is warm. This gets a little cooler in here. Actually, the bounce light coming off the water is a little bit cool. Uh, almost in the purple family, which, by the way, is another thing that I, I always try to talk about, is I know a lot of people, uh, artists will say, think in terms of gray. I, I wouldn't think in terms of gray. I would always think in terms of what color family are you in. I'll get into more of that later. Uh, you can see we've got strong vertical lines here. Uh, and what I'm going to do is in terms of design, I'm going to, th my first thoughts are going to be, uh, Basically, the, the energy and the movement of things. You can see these leaves come down, so that kind of brings your eye down. Brings your eye down to the water. One of the brighter areas in here, I may even push that a little bit. This dark area will stop your eye. If that wasn't there, your eye would slide right out. So you'll move through here. This part here will stop your eye. This beautiful little spot will bring your eye back. These things move up, so it brings your eye back up. These are strong verticals, like I said, so your eye tends to go up. This branch leads you in. So that's what they call kind of a circle pattern. You got kind of the warmest areas right in there. So if you squint at it, just in terms of an abstract design, you've got this beautiful sort of cool area, a warm area. This facing that way, a lot of energy there. The water pulls your eye out. Your eye gets stopped, brought back in. So like I say, it's a big circle. So I think of all these things before I start. I also think about how I'm going to apply the paint because I don't want everything fighting with everything else. So I, I kind of do a whole checklist through my head. And now that I've made the checklist, I think I'm pretty much ready to go. Okay, lastly on, on my materials, as, a, as I said, you can see the palette laid out. This is Michael Harding paint, and these are rosemary brushes. I, for my money, this, this is the best paint in the world. These are the best brushes in the world. Uh, and I'm not just saying that. They're just fabulous. Uh, the consistency, they're buttery. And uh, these brushes are fantastic. They really hold their shape. They're very unique in terms of different designs. They, they hold their edge. Uh, these are great. These things are called swords. These are great to just get like great moves like that. All right, anyway, I'm going to jump in and start. I'll start with this. Just want to get the feel in here. All right, here, uh, my medium is stand oil mixed with turpentine, about half and half. I like a kind of a honey, 
making a nice mess, just like outside. And uh, a little cadmium yellow. I'm trying to uh, just get kind of some abstract that's the great thing about oil paints just get out the old paper towel just try to shape it a little bit already try to get a feel for what I'm doing a little bit of uh, Cadmium lemon and thallo blue to make the greens. I'm just trying to see the whole idea for me is that I want to see this thing finish as fast as possible. I just got to get something on here that's correct, which I kind of feel I'm doing. All right. This is a canvas board, a uh, wood panel that I'm using that I primed myself heavily with just so you can see I've got a lot of texture in here. And I like that because I can paint a little bit thinner and still use the texture of the board. I'm just going to kind of scrub my way through this now. And what I'm doing, again, this is all the interaction of these secondary colors. And this is how I get a lot of feeling of light in my paintings. Um, see, what happens in nature and also what happens with your eye is that your eye craves the complementary color whether you see it or not. It's like on a green day with a lot of white clouds you'll notice that the clouds almost have a pink kind of uh, color t to them. That's because the cones in the eye are always craving the complement. Even if you don't see it you should put it in there. Now I'm getting a little, little textures going back and forth here. And I'm just, like I say, I'm just painting as I go and I'm trying to get the values as right as possible from, from Jump Street. And I just keep working my way out. I'll get back to that. Now, I have a hard, hard dark in here. Not quite that strong. You'll notice I'm using the same brush, too, and I don't mind mixing all the colors up. You know, because in nature, everything is bouncing into everything else anyway. So... And again, I'm not painting things as things. I'm painting things as bits of paint. I'm not, I'm not trying to see, you know, this is a tree and this is a bush and this is this and this is that. I'm trying to abstractly break down what I'm seeing into paint because you can't paint a tree. You can't paint a bush. You can't paint these things. You can only paint light landing on objects and and, uh, you, you know, like a series of bushes, if you start thinking of this bush into that bush, and you'll never get it done. It's a series of, of, of 
of values and color shifts. That's all you're really doing. And then when you're all finished, hopefully, if you did it all right, it looks like trees and bushes. There's a nice little green, and that's way too dark. There's a nice little kind of a green in there. See, I'm trying to get that little soft edge in there. See, now I've got a nice playful bunch of edges going on. Um, just want to see how this looks in here. I'm normally, I'm used to painting outside, fighting off bugs and everything. See, that's pretty. A lot of happy accidents in painting, if you're doing it the right way. If you don't have happy accidents and you're, you're painting too much by a formula. Just kind of, okay. And then there's this section in here. There's a lovely, Feels kind of nice. And there's this dark area in here. All right, let me. Okay, then there's this area. A little more green in here. A little more. A little more yellow. So it's got a nice thing going on in there. There's a little dark area in here I like, so. I'm using the cobalt violet in here. And again, I'm just basing everything I'm seeing, you know, everything is off the interaction of the the secondary colors, purple, green, orange, purple, green, orange. There's a great lesson. I told Eric about this yesterday in the interview. The best lesson on color I ever read from anyone came from Edward Redfield, who wrote a letter. Edward Redfield was a brilliant painter who wrote a letter to uh, Daniel Garber. And in the letter he said, I'm out painting today. He says, with all of the green colors, my white sheep look pink in the field. Then he wrote another letter to Garber uh, later in the year. He said, working in the fall, same spot as the spring, with all the reds, my white sheep appear green. So Redfield knew that the eye is constantly craving the compliment. Okay, so just want to make sure, okay. This lovely brown in here, I love this brown in here, comes off of here. This is going to be really nice. You know what I'm going to do? I want to change brushes. Sort of comes down a little bit. Black. Yeah, this is nice. There's a hard edge in here. Hard edge in there. Okay. So now it sort of joins this all up. Okay, some people probably wonder, like, how do I start from such an abstract place and get to such a finished place so quickly? You know, over I used to sketch everything out. I used to do the whole composition. And then as the thing went on, I found, well, I wanted to change it. Um, I want to be both accurate and I also, at the same time, I, I want some freedom to make changes as they come to me. So look, obviously I've done this many, many times, but I like working from these abstract notes. Like, like for instance, if I make it, if I make too big a decision to put, let's say, that tree right here, and then later on I want to move it to here or here, I'm stuck. So I want the whole painting process for me is 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 a 
it's a process of give and take. It's like, yes, I have to be in control of it. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, I got to let it also take over and tell me what it needs. So, and there's another reason for it, which is over the years, I watched a lot of people who were very, very talented paint some paintings that really, really worked and some paintings that didn't really, really work. And it wasn't, it was, it was basically that I think that they committed too quickly as to, they got too boxed in. And then you're stuck, you're stuck with something that you may not love. And the other thing is, it's hard to paint. It's hard to paint outside, especially. And I find that I have to get a color down and a value down that's correct as quickly as possible. So if I got all this design stuff going on, I got the design in my head, but if I got all this design stuff on all these lines, and let's say the scrubbing is close, but it's not 100%. Well, it's very hard for me to then make a decision based on something that's already inaccurate. So my way of painting is, let me get something down as quickly as possible that's accurate. Because once I get a brush stroke and I go, that's right. I know it sounds ridiculous, yeah, I got a whole painting to paint yet, but the painting in my mind is almost finished with one brush stroke. And what I mean by that is, if that's correct, and I put something next to it that's correct, then I'll, now I've got two things that are correct. If I put a third thing down and it's incorrect, it's going to jump out at me right away and go, that's wrong. This is too dark. This is too light. This is too cool. The edge is wrong. And if I can just proceed that way all the way out, I should have a, a really good painting if I've thought all my steps through you know, in a few hours. So anyway, that's, at least that's the theory. It doesn't always work out, but the notion of getting it right from the very beginning makes sense to me. So I hope that helps. Let me get back to this. Okay. See, that's kind of a nice little area there. Now, well, there we go. One thing about light. See, I, now, for instance, that's a happy accident. I like that brush stroke. I'm going to keep it. I don't know if it's going to survive to the end, but right now I like it. And I'm using a dirty brush. And I'll, I like that too because light, it, you know, light all bounces around. That's what, what it does in nature, you know? So, no. See, look at it. These are all happy accidents. It looks like the woods back in there. Now, you can see these are all feathery strokes, and this light I'm, I'm painting differently. I'm painting this more almost like stucco, you know? I've got like a dance going on, almost like a fight. You know, it's a heavy paint, you know, which indicates light because the heaviness of the paint actually catches the light, whereas thin paint, you know, obviously doesn't. So this paint will shine. On top of it being the right value of color, it will shine. It'll create the feeling of light. So it's actually using the plasticity of the paint itself to catch all the light. So. All right, so like the, the darker sections, the darker sections are thinly painted because as a general rule, we don't want them to shine. We just want to keep them dark and mysterious. There's a really nice greenish green, almost in the purple family kind of thing going on in here. That's a nice color. It's definitely down a notch in terms of value.
tent. I'm also thinking of atmospheric perspective. See, because a lot of the painting, too, is that I know, for instance, these very delicate branches in here. Once these delicate branches are laid in, you don't really... These other things are more like abstract shapes. So a lot of the painting is going to be basically about these trunks, these major trunks, and everything else is just going to be secondary, which is what you want because if you don't watch out, everything starts fighting for interest. So I just want these things to lay back. You know, be lay back, be beautiful. soft edge in there. I'm doing a little bit of squinting here and there. I'm squinting because I, I, I don't want to see things as objects. I just want to see them as values, colors. I don't want to get too caught up in the reality of it. Okay. All right, so that's looking pretty good. So this seems to lay back in here. I want to keep make that too bright because then it'll come too far forward. I don't want it to fight. Okay, then it sort of comes across here. I'll put these trees about here. I have a dark spot in here. Okay, this is just a beautiful little area in here. Let me pull that back a little bit. More, leave a little breath in there, you know? That's what I'm saying. Like, now I'm starting to see the painting, and I would much prefer to paint it this way because it's kind of telling me what it needs a little bit. All right, I'm going to just lay some of this water in a little bit. And what do we think about water? Water is moving this way. So let's try to get the direction of it. See, already this feels like water. This brings your eye back in. The eye, the sky is bringing your eye down. Now, water is always moving, even still water. So I don't want to make this edge in here too hard unless I'm doing it, unless it's really going on or I'm doing it for some dramatic reason. If I, if I make the edge too hard, it won't look like it's moving. See, like, the more I kind of make it lost, the better almost. And that kind of gets, these things almost blend together. Okay. There's a couple of, I'd say, white highlights in here. And even if there's not, I'm going to make it that way. Okay. And it gets, uh, my hands are getting covered with paint. And then this area in here, the still water reflects all of this. The moving water reflects more of the sky coming down. Now, what I have to watch out for, these two greens are very, very close. So, this, it's a little, I just want to get, give myself some sort of indication of what that edge is going to look like on the water there. A lot of that light is spilling down here. The essence of Impressionism is to violate all the rules of painting by stripping away the true representation of the objects or people portrayed. You are left with the artist's emotional view of the subject, the artist's impression. When you view impressionistic paintings, you're looking at the subject through the eyes of the artist. You don't simply see a person or a place. You see the expressions of Renoir, the brushstrokes of Monet, the implications of Van Gogh, the textures of Manet. Now you can unlock the secret to Impressionistic Landscape Painting with a new video course, Impressionistic Landscape Painting with George Gallo. Hollywood film director and screenwriter George Gallo is an award-winning painter 
author, and master of Impressionism. His goal is to help everyone learn and understand how to paint Impressionism. I'm going to try to get you guys to think like a painter, think like a painter. What I mean by that is, is to, how to transform what you're seeing and break it down into paint. Watch George Gallo create a gorgeous impressionistic landscape, showing you every step of creating textures, color, light, layers, and more, and providing valuable and easy to follow instructions. You can't paint in a way that you're not yourself. So obviously, you may have put together by now that I'm a large, gregarious person. I can be loud. So I'm going to paint in that fashion because that's who I am. I have to surrender to what I am. You, know, you can't pretend to be something you're not. So you are what you are. So you have to paint towards that. You know, Otherwise, you're fighting something your whole life. You'll learn to create impressionistic landscape paintings that invoke emotions, visual connections, and a sense of place how to create color harmony, balance the composition, and master the brush strokes that make an impressionistic painting come alive. How to use atmospheric perspective to create a sense of depth and much more. Whether you've been painting for 50 years or just starting out, don't miss your chance to discover how to create your own impressionistic paintings. Impressionistic Landscape Painting with George Gallo is now available on video. Well, that was Impressionistic Landscape Painting with George Gallo, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code in the comments section. Now let's get right to our interview with George Gallo. He's a lot of fun. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Today I'm pleased to interview artist and film director, writer, George Gallo. George, welcome. Great to be here, Eric. Wow, so uh, this is a thrill to have time with you and to to learn about your art career and, and maybe you'll touch on your film career as well. Whatever you'd like. So um, art is what's most important to me. So let's talk about that first. You uh, first discovered this art thing or got interested in painting how? Well, I, I got interested in, I mean, I was drawing as a kid. I mean, like I remember when I was about three years old, uh, very clearly, uh, I, I, I became fascinated with this image of a helicopter that was on a, on a book, you know, and, and I started drawing the helicopter and my mom said, who did this? And I said, I did it. And she goes, do another one. She didn't believe me. And then I did another one. And then, you know, and I just was obsessed with images and, and drawing, you know, and, and then oil painting uh, started when I was about 12, 13 years old. I just, uh, I, I, my mom was a big influence. You know, I said to my mom, what is, you know, I saw a painting in a, in a book. I saw the heavy brush strokes, and I said, wow, you know, what's that? She goes, that's oil paint. Do you remember the book? I don't remember the book specifically, you know, but I do remember, I have to tell you, I did have an incident, and it always sounds, I can't describe it. Uh, I'll do the best I can to describe it. I was about 12 or 13 years old, and my father had a friend named Steve, and we used to go over to his house and hang out. My dad would sit and have a glass of wine with him, and they'd sit in the backyard and chat. He was our neighbor. They were like they grew up as kids together. And my he had a print on the wall. I mean, this, I mean, it, it, it almost sounds it almost maybe sounds silly, but to me it was like it was a life changing event. I mean, literally a life changing event. There well, we a, have epiphany moments that well, that are sometimes very simple. Yeah, this was one, and it was a a Robert Wood painting. It was a print. It was a 24 by 48, and it was called Autumn Bronze. And I looked at it, and I couldn't believe how the water looked so still and perfect, and there were these trees just all leaning in, and I could almost feel and smell the autumn leaves, you know. And I, I looked at that thing, and I went, "Oh my God! How do people do that?" You know, and I, and I was just hooked. I mean, from that moment on, I mean, I, I remember I asked my friends, uh, my father's friend, I said, can, can I borrow that print? He went, no, you know, because I wanted to see if I could copy it. But, you know, you talk about fate. Um, next to my junior high school was a building that said Donald Art Company on it. It was literally right the next building over. 
And, you know, I was always a very uh, kind of gutsy kid, you know, so like I figured, oh, you know, I'll go in there and see what they do. I go inside there, and they made prints for the mass market. Really? That's it, yeah, and they, they were the biggest printmaker in the world, and it was in, in my basically my backyard. So I went in there, and I saw all these original paintings that they were making prints for, and they made that print that my friend Steve had, uh, my father's friend Steve had. And I asked, how much does it cost to buy these prints? So this guy that worked there, the Sal, the Sal Gonderall, a great guy, he worked in the back. He said, he goes, I'll give you all the prints you want, kid. So he gave me like, I don't know, maybe a hundred of these prints and I unrolled them all and I, I started copying Robert Wood, uh, you know, Monet. I started, how did you do that brush stroke and how do you do that, you know, and I, that's how I started. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, and I just, uh, I mean, I had, I had hundreds of these little paintings that I were just copying from, from, from masters. So you were in high school at that time? I was in junior high school, yeah. Okay, so uh, you did a film that, uh, Local Color, which was essentially about your life, yes? It was about my life, yeah, my, about my 18th year, the summer of my 18th year. All right, so first take us from junior high school to that point and then tell us about that experience. Okay, well then I started painting and then I won an award when I was 15 for oil painting in New York State and I kind of fudged. You had to be 16, 17 or 18 when I was 15 and I said I was 16 and I, and I, I won an, a, a, an award, statewide award and I kept painting and um, Let's see, high school, yeah, you know, I tried to get deeper and deeper into it. You know, like I was reading every book I could read on it. Um, I read Carlson's landscape book when I was about 16, 17, didn't understand a word of it. You know, I mean, I, you know, to be honest with you, I keep it on my nightstand. I'm still just starting to understand some of the stuff that Carlson talks about. It's so, it's like a, the Bible of well, landscape. Well, that's the book you just have to kind of read and reread yeah, and reread. Absolutely. And it, it, it's ever changing as you understand more and more. Yeah, I mean, the older you get, I mean, you think you know everything at 18 and in a funny way. I never felt the way about painting, I felt the way about life, oh, you know everything. The older you get, the more you realize, the less you know, and, you know, and, which is fine, you know, it's, it's okay, you know, because right. you're constantly trying to learn, you know. Uh, but throughout high school, uh, just kept painting and painting, reading every book I could. I started to discover other painters that I really, really liked. Uh, one of them was... Uh, uh, Edward Redfield, we, we, uh, the, the Pennsylvania Impressionist, who I just adore, very, very kind of Russian. And, uh, and you, you kind of grew up in that area, didn't you? Yeah, I grew up in New York State, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to, north of the city, so a little more rural. And uh, I started taking trips into the city. I started skipping high school, so any, any uh, I don't know if you want that part in here, but uh, I did. Kids, don't do this at yeah, home. Don't do that, yeah, but I, <laughs> I'm like, instead of going to school, I was just obsessed with painting, you know. And uh, I would take the train into New, York, into New York City, and there was this place, Grand Central Art Galleries, and they had all the Redfield paintings in there. And I just, to see them up close, was like, oh my God, you know, these huge paintings with all this color and design. And I, I was like, how do mortals do this stuff? Then was Redfield alive at that time? Redfield was, no, he's not alive. Redfield lived to be 97 years old, I believe, but. Uh, he, uh, no, he had been probably gone about 10 years. Yeah. And so that's how you got to know the people at Grand Central. Yeah, and there was a guy there, John Evans, that ran the gallery, and another, uh, another woman, Lois Wagner. They were just wonderful people. And a very similar thing, they saw me looking at the Redfields, and they said, are you a painter? And I, I said, well, I'm trying to be a painter, you know. And I think, you know, at that time, especially in the 70s, it was very unique, I think, for someone to want to paint like that because realism was sort of shot, you know. Sort and of, everything had gone abstract. Yeah, and so here I was, this, you know, this 18-year-old guy wanting to learn how to actually paint, you know. So uh, they gave me stacks of transparencies, you know, those uh, four by fives, and I would, you know, look at them. I didn't have a light box or anything, but I would look at them and try to copy that. I mean... I think a lot of painting when you're starting out is, you know, you're, you're, you're copying other painters and right. it's hard to, uh, I think it's, 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 I think it's impossible to paint from life from giddy app. I, I, I think, I think you get to that place where you start to understand what paint can do, you know, uh, you, you know what I mean? The, the, what other great people have done with paint, you start to pick up some of those things and then you, 
in an abstract way, you figure out how to apply it to your own needs as an artist, and then you can work from life, you know. But so is that is that a recommended starting point for somebody? You you believe they should start out by copying well, masters? Well, I, I do. I mean, I do because I think you learn how to walk by looking at your mom and dad walk around the house. I mean, everything in life is is we pick things up from others. I mean, right. we learn how to talk by hearing others. I mean, you know, we learn about music as we hear it, and we get attracted to certain sounds, you know, and, and, and all musicians have influences. Uh, the same way all artists have influences. You have influences because they're touching something in your nature. You know, it's not that you just want to paint like them. They're, they're, they're touching something in your soul, and you go, that's the truth. So, yeah, you're going to, I think in some way you can learn by copying, but eventually you turn into, you know, you become more and more yourself, hopefully, you know. Well, I think one of the values of copying is that you find the subtleties because um, if, if you're really serious about copying, you can find out that one little tiny, oddly shaped, abstract brush stroke can completely change the nature of a painting. Yes. Now, I remember uh, doing one of the first copies and I was painting a figure and just that tiny little difference made the figure go from looking heavy to looking thin. And it was those little lessons that really sunk in and, and started, I started realizing, you know, how much every little thing mattered, every little spot mattered. Like, so over the years I started to realize, especially in the last few years, I started to realize I was getting better. And then I said to myself, well, well what does that mean, getting better at painting? Like, right. you know, you know, like how am I getting better? It's like, uh, and I, because that's not really, you know, this is a good thing for students, getting better, you got to be, I think, define more what that means. And I realized I was becoming more observant. And because I was becoming more observant of nature, I could paint it more freely because I, I was like, well, that yellow is definitely a little different than that yellow. And those are things I wouldn't see in the past. You know, I started to really notice differences. Like, right. you know, and, and, and my paintings, definitely, I think, have changed quite a bit in the last few years. Don't you also think that once you get to the point where the process or the technical process of painting becomes second nature, then you don't have to think as much about the process, so that's more freeing? That's 100% correct. You know, in terms of like, it's easier to communicate because I don't think about the words. Like, what word am I going to say next? I only know 12 words, so, you know, it's going to be hard to communicate, you know? Well, it's like the keyboard, right? It's, you, you don't have, or, or when we were playing guitar last night over dinner, you said, well, you don't, you're not having to look to see where to place right. your fingers. It's, it's a sense of, of, of freedom by, if you have your palette laid out and you always know where your colors are and you always know what your mixes are gonna be, you, once you get to the point as a, at least as a beginner where you don't have to think about those things, then you're able to just paint instinctively. Yes, I, I think the hardest thing, for, I mean, look, again, it's, it's like, and I, I see students struggle, you know, and I always feel horrible because a lot of their struggles I went through, and oddly enough, I'm just going through a more refined version of it now. It's like, I don't think that ever goes away. It's like, because David LaFell said to me, George, it just never gets easier, because you keep pushing yourself to get, you know, better. So, you know, I do catch myself still uh, not struggling. I mean, I, I, what I finally have learned to get out of the way is questioning myself, you know, like uh, that whole sometimes deconstructive process if you're a student and you're working and you go, oh, this is not good and I'm never gonna get this right. And, you know, and you start to deconstruct everything you're doing until you, you've got a big mess. I think if you're honest with yourself, you're still always doing that, but not to that horrific degree. I mean, I mean, you're always analyzing when you're, when, when, I'm obviously left-handed, you know, when you're looking at something and you put it down and you're analyzing, is that right? Is this correct? Is that right? Does that compliment that, you know? So they're, they're more uh, uh, constructive inner dialogues, you know, but, uh, you know, I don't have that, uh, that, destructive one anymore, you know, which I think uh, can happen, you know. You, you know, I sometimes find when painting that I'm spending too much time thinking about what other people are going to think. Yeah, that's the word. See, you, you got to shut all that out. That's a part of what I'm saying. You have to shut all that stuff out. It's very hard to, 
the, the biggest release that I have gotten, and it's why I love painting so much, is that I don't care anymore. It's just like I just surrender to the moment. It's like it's a surrender. It becomes so much less about actually the painting. The painting is almost secondary, if that makes any sense. Because if you start getting wrapped up in the painting, you go crazy. It's like surrender to the moment. This is a wonderful moment in time. You're here in nature. You know, you have this opportunity to do something, to say something beautiful and just surrender to it, man. And just let it go where it's going to go and just let it take you, you know, otherwise, you know what I mean? Otherwise it, it becomes kind of a super, uh, I mean, anal exercise of just, you, you know, it's just trying not, too hard. It's not joyful. Yeah. I mean, if anything, when you look at the impressionists, they don't give a hoot when, in the, you know, what they, what you think. I mean, they're trying to stretch the boundaries of paint. That's why people love them. I mean, you don't look at an impressionist painting and go, oh, look, he got the shoe just right on this figure. I mean, that's not what impressionism is about. It's about passion and guts and not caring and observation and embracing nature. That's what those paintings are about. So how do you get there? Because I, I remember one time... To that free space? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I don't, yeah, sorry. I, I remember one time I, I was uh, camping with the family and I noticed it was getting to be about sunset time. I said to my wife, I need just a few minutes. I'm going to go over to the lighthouse on the beach and, and grab a quick painting. And I took a small panel and I ran over to the beach and I set up the easel and the wind is blowing and I'm having to mm. hold the easel down, I know which one. is distracting me. And I've got literally five minutes because that sun's going down and I'm just just laying down brush strokes and there was no time to think there was no time to analyze and it turned out to be one of the favorite paintings I've ever done because it had pure instinct That's and good. no thought now so, it, was, it was all Eric without Eric getting in the way which right. is funny because like I yeah I know what you're talking about yeah so how do you capture it how do you get there because you, we don't always you know we're not always in that situation you paint in your studio in in uh, Los Angeles, right? Um, and I'm out is, I'm out and about painting a lot too. You're I'm outside like, a lot. Yeah, yeah. I load up the car. Like lately, I've been painting more in the studio, which is an interesting thing, like plein air versus studio work. Well, let's talk about that because I think that's a really important distinction because most people would say that your work changes once you go outdoors. Your work changes definitely uh, because I think a lot, when you're out, to, I find, at least for me, I can't speak, you know, definitively, I'm more of a, of a person who records what they're seeing when I'm outside. Yes, I make choices in terms of, look, just the fact that you point your, your canvas in a certain direction, you've already made a design choice, you know, but I, I find that I'm more recording what I'm seeing, my excitement about what I'm seeing, I'm, I'm recording it in a way where I know I don't have a lot of time. So I'm, because the sun's moving, you know, you get about an hour and a half, you know, before everything changes. And I try to get it down the best that I can. They're very, ex they're, they're, they work, they're exciting pieces, mm -hmm. you know. I think when you, and you have to do that because you can't work off of photographs if you haven't worked from nature. You can work off of photographs if you work from nature a lot, you know, and you know when you look at a photo, you know what's really going on because the values are generally way off, you know, in, in photos. Uh, but because in nature, I notice a lot of values are very, very close, whereas in photos, they can be very more extreme, you know. You get the subtleties in nature and, and a camera has a light meter that averages everything. The skies are blown out, the right. shadows are too dark, right. and, and the values become much more contrasting right. in nature. So I want to go back. Um, oh, but to finish my thought about yeah. a studio painting, I think ultimately I'm a better painter in the studio. I may be dead wrong about this, but I think I'm a better painter inside only because I am not in such a mad rush. You know, and I can think about what I'm doing and I can lay a brush stroke down and I can look at the brush stroke and say, now is that working and do I like that edge? Do I like that? You know what, I'm going to warm that up just a tad, you know, or I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to put this here and I'm going to put that there. And then you can sit and look at it for a couple of minutes and really think and reflect about what you're doing and you can build a painting. Now, I can only build it on experiences 
that I've done outside because I know under certain light conditions, this is how this is going to behave. But I think I'm more thoughtful, you know, as opposed to yipe, you know, outside, you know. <laughs> yipe is you right. Know, you know, because you, you're painting like with a gun to your head because yeah. the, the sun is moving. It's not like, hey, could you slow down? I just want to get this tree branch. You know, it's... Uh, but the other good thing is that you learn about from painting outside that I try to incorporate in the studio work is that everything in nature is always moving. In a photograph, it's not moving, but in nature, it's moving. The clouds are moving, the trees right. are moving in the breeze, there's birds flying. Even still water is rippling somewhat. I mean, everything is in constant motion. So I try to get that into the work, you know. How do you put motion in a painting? Uh, I mean, motion to me would be an edge sometimes, like a hard edge would look like the like a delineation of something, you know, where a soft edge might might create a sense of movement. A series of soft edges, and or sometimes like a, if you're doing a water, like a you know a few strokes to just indicate that if there are trees above the water, you know, just to get that feeling, you have to pretty much get it right the first time because the second you try to go over, it looks, you know, muddy, muddy in your yeah, unless you want mud, right? You know, because what was it uh, was it Worcester said mud was a great color in the wrong place, you know? Right. What I mean, so it's all temperature stuff, you know, but yeah. Anyway, I, that's what I love about it. I mean. It is a little bit of a performance art painting, you know, it, which is part of what I like about it. You oh, know. you're a performer. I suppose. So uh, I want to go back. Yeah. So because you you wrote this movie, as a matter of fact, I think we met originally because I think we did. You were you you had filmed this this movie, Local Color, right? And uh, you called me about some, some the magazine getting some exposure or something. I think that's when we first kind of hit yes, it off. Yes. Um, you wrote that movie really about your life. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that started with you meeting Cherepov. Right. Tell me about that experience. I met George Cherepov. Uh, I was 18 years old. There was a frame shop. I started hanging around this frame shop. Though this guy, that had, this guy was a genius. Uh, uh, aside from Cherepov, there was a guy named. Aurelio Yamarino, okay, that's a, 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 an Italian American guy who made frames for just about everybody in town, handmade frames, but his drawings were just unbelievable. I mean, he had an insane gift for drawing, and he sort of like become this forgotten figure. And I, and Yami was his nickname, and I, and it, Charles Journey plays him in the movie, and I, I used to say to him, Yami. Why don't you put this stuff out there? And he goes, oh, there's no time, there's no time, there's no time. He was just always making frames. He goes, oh, my day isn't long enough, he would always say. I, I just love this guy. He had those crazy white hair and glasses, just a great guy. And uh, he was friends with Cherepov. And uh, one day I got a hold of one of Cherepov's books, and uh, I said, yeah, any chance that you can introduce me to him? And uh, he did, and I went and knocked on the door. Cherepov wasn't terribly open to wanting to teach I, at the time, you know, but he, he took me in. And in the movie, when you first knock on the door, he's rejecting you. Yes. Is that, is that real life? Uh, or artistic license? A little bit of artistic license. I based Cherepov on, on me. Uh, the character in the movie was uh, uh, Nikolai Serov. I based that character partially on Cherepov and partially on this other guy who I don't want to mention his name, who was the world's angriest painter, who I thought was hysterical, okay? But I melded sort of the two characters together in the Nikolai character. Made it more interesting, certainly. Well, yeah, in any kind of look, even the paintings, movies, whatever it is, you want conflict I mean, in the work. You want, it can't just be all nice. You know, you have to, you know, things have to go against other things. They call it, what, tension, I guess? Uh, tension or drama. It, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, it's in painting you want tension. You want this against this. You know, you don't want everything going in the same direction. You know, everything in the same color. There has to be, obviously, a conflict going on in it. In it. So the, um, the, the premise of the film Local Color, which everyone should see, is this young man who is struggling with painting and he's learning from this master who's been a, a kind of a jerk to him for a while. Yeah. And... Tell me a little bit about the story and then why you decided to do that film. Well, you know, it's funny. I, 
the part of me didn't want to do it because I didn't want to put my own personal life on screen because first of all, like who, other than me, who thinks it's terribly interesting. And it was sort of a, it was a sort of a portrait in, in many ways of a kid getting let down by two fathers. I mean, you know, my first father did not support the painting thing at all. You know, in fact, it kind of is, is you, without going into much about the movie, I mean, my, my love, my father was a great guy, but he was an Italian-American working class guy who, you didn't tell a guy like that you wanted to be a painter. I mean, you know, right. suddenly they had all kinds of questions about your sexuality and all kinds of stuff, you know. So, uh, which is part of the theme of the movie. If you remember, the dad was just saying, do you like girls, do you like girls? And I'm like, dad, I just want to paint. You know, I know what you're talking about. But, and I try to do it in a humorous way, but, uh, and then Cherepov, you know, that character, Nikolai Serov in the movie kind of lets, lets the kid down in a way too that he won't, he won't completely cooperate with him because he sort of has turned his back on his own art and his own world and his own heart. So it was this kid going through a series of letdowns until finally he gets to the other side of it. Um, what made me want to do it was I would tell people the story sometimes, you know, like Julie, my wife of 33 years, hello Julie, love of my life, um, said you got to make a movie out of this because every time you tell the story to somebody they're just like fascinated by it. And then I wrote the script and she ended up producing the movie. Um, but I gave it to some studios and they kept saying the same thing, you know, um, you have to put more sex in it, you have to put more this in it, more that. And I'm like, no, that's not what happened. It's not that kind of coming of age story. You know, he, yes, he meets a girl in the story, but it was about beginnings to me. Because local color, if you see the movie, by the end of the movie, he's not a great painter, but he's on his way. And that to right. me, that was good enough. I mean, what is he going to like win the contest at 18? I mean, it's craziness, you know. So I, they wanted to make it all Hollywood jive, you know. Well, I think, I think that's a really important point, though, because um, you put uh, your financial life on the line. Yeah, we did. You put your career on the line. Yes, I did. And you, you made this movie, you managed to get people that you knew had relationships with to step up and help you. You had, uh, I remember you telling me you put a second mortgage or something on your house. Yeah we, yeah, we did. We put a second mortgage on the house, which was nuts. But, you know, Julie said, look, we don't have kids. Let's, this will be our child. Let's make a movie about, and, and it seemed to me also, you know, and then I'll get into all the details of how we made it. It, it seemed to me that I was taking great offense, you know, that that beauty was being uh, denied in some way. I don't know how to describe it, that, that beauty and art was seeming like passe and ridiculous and any kind of nostalgia was just negative. And I was starting to take offense to it. I was taking offense to it because I saw where a lot of stuff in Hollywood was going. I saw where a lot of literature was going. And I'm not saying anything has to be all Pollyanna, but, but this constant uh, extraction of beauty and, de and decency, if you want to call it God, whatever you want to call it, there was this constant removal of it. And it was making me mad. And I, I, th I think beauty is an essential it is maybe the most essential thing in our lives. You know, it, it, it has to be there. And sometimes you have to find it, right. you know? And so I became more and more determined to make the movie. And so was so did my wife, uh, Julie. And she said, let's put the house up. Let's do it. I mean, my hands were shaking when I wrote, you know, because here I'm like taking a loan against everything we worked for. But we made the movie for about a million dollars. The movie should have cost six million dollars because I called up all my actor friends and I said, "Look, I, I called Ray Liotta, Armin Mueller-Stahl, two-time Academy Award nominee, uh, the, Trevor Morgan, the kid is great, Samantha Mathis, Ron Perlman, uh, Diana Scarwood. I mean, people have been nominated for Academy Awards. I called them all up and said, "Look, I put my house up. I'm making a movie. I know I'm nuts." I can't pay anything other than scale. I know you guys make hundreds of thousands, if not millions in the movie. They all said, we're in. Anybody's crazy enough to put their house up, you know, we're in. Well, and that says a lot about your relationships with people over the years and how you've treated them. 
Yeah, they, yeah, I don't, uh, it's funny, if I, a friend of mine said to me, you know, because we, we were sitting around and I was watching the television, I called my friend up, uh, Frank Renzulli, uh, who wrote for The Sopranos, a terrific writer, executive producer, and I was watching a movie and I said, you know, I mean, just being honest with you, and you can keep it in the interview, I don't, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an honest moment. I was watching a movie by a very well-known director and I, was, I said to myself, I said, I could do this as well, if not better, but this guy's just one of the top directors and I'm always out there, you know, sh trying to shake the trees for work. I said, how come, you know, I don't have that kind of success? I was just talking out loud, you know? And he said to me, he goes, George, you're not mentally ill enough to have that kind of success. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He goes, George, you love beauty. You love your wife. You stay home at night. He goes, these people, they have five wives and they throw the, you know, they throw, they've got 20 kids that they don't know their names. He goes, you're not that guy. And I went, you're right, I'm not that guy. And, he, he, and, he, and I can't paint the way I do if I was that guy, you know? Right. So. Well, well first off, um, we could probably talk about the movie and the film industry, which you've put your entire career, for, you know, probably I could, forever. I could do days on this. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think what's interesting about it is, you know, we, we hear a lot about, those of us who are not part of that life, we hear about the glamour and, and the, you know, all the stuff. Living goes, the dream, huh? Yeah, yeah. living the dream, but it's a, it's a very difficult industry. Uh, it's feast and famine for a lot of people. Um, I, I'm sh and, and yet, you said to me last night something I thought was so remarkable, and that is you said, if I could give it all up and do one thing, that one thing would be painting. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've always felt this way because I've been asked, you know, you write movies, you direct movies, I, I'm a musician. Uh, you're also a painter. I, I started out as a painter, you know, so it's like it's the thing that goes back the longest for me. And if someone said, if you had to give it all up, you know, what, what would you give up and what would you keep? I, I would throw it all away just to paint. I, it just does something so deep inside of me. I'll, I'll tell you the truth, Eric, for the life of me, and it's not like I'm not trying to be cute or something. You're not cute. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. I don't know for the life of me, why I do it, okay? It's not to copy things, it's, it's I think, I, I feel the most centered, <clears throat> I feel the most centered when I'm working on a painting, and I lay down a brush stroke and it's just right. I, I really, again, and I'm not what I would call a deeply religious man, okay? But I, I am in terms of the fact I do believe in some higher power, I do believe that that higher power has led me. I, it's impossible not to see it. You know, I mean, so many times I went left instead of right, and it led to something fantastic. You know, so I have to believe there's some sort of intelligent design in all of this. It's not. It can't just be random. But I feel like when I'm working and I see sunlight touching something, or and I'm trying to paint it, it's like I'm I'm giving back something. I don't know how to describe it other than that. I mean, I paint for very pure reasons. I'm. I'm giving something back, and I feel like as close to God as I can get. You know, I, I like to say that a day without painting is like a day without oxygen. Well, I believe that. Y yeah. yeah, because you know, uh, and I don't understand it. I, I, but once it started happening, it's something that I have to do, and I and mm -hmm. I can't articulate it. So I, I totally understand what you're yeah. saying. So I mean, some of it's a little bit problem solving. If you have a problem solving mentality, which we obviously do, you put something down, and you go, "Well, why isn't that right?" And you go, "No, no, no. Oh, now that's better." So it's a constant series of solving problems. So the kid in us that loves puzzles and things, you know, right. I think that's part. Well, what I love about it is that you 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 never get bored because you always want to push yourself up to the next yeah. level. It's always challenging. You know, I, golf is always challenging too. But at the end of the day, you don't golf have much, also got me. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, you know, all you got is that scorecard. But at the end of the day, I have, you know, a painting, and you have a painting. And yeah. and um, I was talking to somebody the other day about the the whole plein air movement, and I want to talk to you about that. Sure. The um, I won't sell my studies. Now you're going out and doing these giant canvases on location. I don't have that skill. I do small ones. And there's and then no I make, skill. It's yipe. I told you. It's, it's a yipe. lot of yipe. 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 Uh. So talk to me about the plein air movement. You know, look, it's it, it's great because it, it was, as far as I could tell, it was pretty non-existent in the 1970s. I mean, when Cherepov in 1974, when I met him, there was no big 
there weren't plein air magazines. There was American artists and stuff like that, you know, uh, you know, but there wasn't, it didn't seem to be like a movement like it is now. Um, I, look, I hear people saying, uh, you know, that it's coming back and all of that. And I believe it's coming back. It, it, it could explode. My issues with it is that I think a lot of people, there hasn't been a major art movement in the United States in a very long time, if you think about it. Even you know, if you look at the abstract painters, the modernists, who uh, I know some people say are not really a part of, uh, I've, I've heard, I've read things about this, but they, they are, look, they're painters, and I'm not an anti-modernist. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff you can learn from the modernist movement. I'm not one of those, you know, you know tunnel vision type of guys. You mean like me? Well, I mean, look, it's all, look, some of it's nonsense. And I understand the idea that people went further and further out there. And in, 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 in terms of all revolutions, you know, people, you know, things get damaged and there's blood in the streets. I understand that that all happened. And, but now it's time to come back, you know. I mean, yeah. The pendulum always goes back and forth. Yeah, it had to go that way. You know what I mean? So it was so great. I mean, once Monet started looking into his pond and painting the lily pads, just just in those extreme close-ups, those huger ones he did, I mean, that's the beginning of seeing the canvas as a two-dimensional object. You know, that's the beginning of losing sense of depth, just color, throwing a lot of things out the window. I understand then it just became expressionist. I mean, you could just obviously see the chain of how it all went. I mean, but it, it hit a wall and it's done now, you know? So um, that's not to say there can't be another great modernist painter out there. I'm not saying that. But as a movement, I think it kind of lost its steam. It, it, where can it go, you know? Well the, well, the plein air movement today is the largest movement in the history of art. Well, you see, that's great to hear. I think, here's my issue with it, is that you know, and I can, and, and I hope that people understand that what I'm saying is coming from the purest of places. Nothing would make me happier than to see it take over and get its right, rightful spot. I mean, you know, I'm a part of that movement. You know, I mean, who, who wouldn't want to see that happen? What I see not happening is that people want this revolution to happen without firing any shots. They want this revolution to happen. Revolutions are by their nature bloody, okay? And what I mean by that is, I mean, there's no such thing as a polite revolution and we went upstairs and we talked to the king and he said, you're right, I am gonna step down. No, they're brutal takeovers, okay? So the paintings have to be brutally honest. They can't be safe. You can't do safe, polite art and have a revolution. If you look at the, to me, the best of the realists, if you look at Winslow Homer and you look at George Wesley Bellows and Robert Henry and you look at uh, John Singer Sargent, especially all of his landscape paintings, they were beautiful, but they were raw. They were gutsy. They were not like, ooh, I'm going to sell this one. I mean, they just were like, they were painting out of their guts. And if you could get 20 painters in the United States to paint out of their guts, not like, oh, I'm gonna, maybe I'll make the rent this month. I mean, if you could get people to paint like you know, well, you're talking about two different things, though. There, there, there's a there's an art movement. The plein air movement is huge right now. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, there are more people painting in plein air than there ever have been in history. Well, that's great. Now, now most of them are hobby painters. Most of them are not ever intending to be professionals or sell their paintings. They're doing it because they love the passion of being outdoors and painting with other people and and having their, their form of self-expression. What you're saying, though, is for it to be a revolution, for it to break through, then there needs to be... And back the, in the museums where it belongs, yeah. Yeah, well, there needs to be a, enough painters who are really cutting through, who are going beyond what everybody's doing right now. Yeah, I mean, what I also mean by that, I mean, it, it, a lot of it's just attitude. Like, I have a lot of friends that are painters, you know, and there's very few of them out there who are out on a limb. Mm -hmm. And I understand why they're not on the limb. They're going to feed their kids, you know. They they they're going to feed their they they've got lives, you know, and they and they're painting for a living. But and I've I've had painters come over to my house, you know, guys that just paint full time for a living, and they'll they'll look at my work and they'll see like some like some fifty by sixty I did outside, 
And they'll say to me, oh man, George, I'd love to just go out there and go nuts like this. And I'm like, well then do it. Yeah, why not do why, it? Why, why, do it. Absolutely. You know, life's too short, man. I mean, I was 18 like three minutes ago. I'm 61 years old now. It's just marching by quickly, you know. It goes by very fast. Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to get caught at the end saying, you know, I should have done this and I should have done that and I had that idea. I mean, I, w I want to wring out every creative idea I've got. When I go, I'm going, all right, take me. I'm out of ideas, man. That's it. I'm done. So you're, well, you'll never be out of ideas. No. Um, what is the difference? Because I was thinking about this last night. Um, you are surrounded by a lot of people who are at the, the top of their game. Um, you're surrounded by painters who are at the top of the game. You and David LaFell are, are very close friends. I just talked to him 10 minutes ago. There you go. Uh, you are surrounded by the world's best actors, the world's best directors, the world's best writers. So they do something differently. What's the difference between people at the top of their game and people who are not going for it. Is that just it? They're just going for it? Oh, and man. I'll be honest. You say on the top of your game, you mean successful, because successful, they're like different kinds of success. I know people at the top who defy gravity. When they trip, they go upstairs. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I mean, I can't, you know, I've seen, I've seen it with actors. Like, this guy got that. I mean, I, you know, he's so dumb. It's like, I can't, you know, I, I, I cannot tell you. And they go all the way to the top, you know. Um, but there are also people, uh, that's not true with cinematographers and editors and, and music people. You know, actors, it's an interesting when actors, some actors are geniuses, there's no doubt about it. And I'm not putting actors down because I love actors because I write words, I put them in their mouths, and they make it come to life. And every time I look at a great actor, I'm like, how the hell did they just do that? Because they took something and they put so much emotion and so much backstory and so much life into a simple line of dialogue, you know, that you go, oh my, you know, it's great to watch when it happens. Uh, what is, so to answer your question, I would say there's a sense of fearless, fearlessness. How do you get that? Fearless? I think it's something you're kind of born with. I, I, and they can, you can be very fearful and be fearless, which is what happens a lot, I think, with artists. It's like, look, you know, I was involved a little bit with the various uh, organizations that helped the troops and stuff like that. You know, people that win medals in wars, you know, a lot of times the guys that are like frightened under fire and one minute they go nuts and they just, you know, because they just can't take it anymore and you become a hero or you do something heroic. I mean, there's something in you. I mean, there, I think fearlessness, there's just something that goes, I don't care if this is good or bad or whatever it is, I just, I just have to surrender to it. We're getting back to surrender again. I have to surrender to this feeling, this emotion, this whatever it is, and I'm gonna go by it. I'll tell you one thing that's interesting about it. I tried to be that way in my work. You know, there's a lot of times I could have been, you know, taking the easy way out, and I didn't. Even as a writer, you know, I, I mean, I've made like 20 movies, okay, so I've directed 10 of them. You know, I mean, I've had a hell of a career. I'm sure I could have doubled or tripled that, you know, but the fact of it is I was like, eh, I've seen that already and I don't want to go that way. So I was always trying to do something a little off, a little different, you know, it was I just didn't want to play it safe. And I think, I think uh, those people, you talk about Al Pacino, Al Pacino doesn't play it safe. You know, uh, De Niro doesn't play it safe. You know what I mean? Uh, you look at all the greats, they don't play it safe. Great directors, they don't play it safe. Yeah, I know a million people shoot it this way. I'm shooting it this way. So yeah. it, oh, it, the thing I wanted to say is that once you start doing that and you start taking some chances and they start working out, you start really trusting your creative instincts, which is the same thing for painting. It's like there's a couple of times I stepped out on a limb and I went, oh, no, no, no. And I went, ooh, that was nice. And then you start getting feelings like I can, I can rely on this other sense now. And then that's like a, a repertoire that you start to build, you know, which is, I don't know why I'm doing this. It makes no even sense why I'm doing it this way, but I know I have to do it this way. And because I've got a track record of it working out, I'm just gonna follow my guts. Do you find yourself 
uh, fearless or do you find yourself having fear and just saying, you know what, I'm going to go for it anyway? I have tons of fear. I, I, if anything, throughout my life, you, you, you know, it's funny, if you look at my life on paper, because I've had friends of mine from back east say, how did you do this? You know, you grew up in a family that had nothing to do with the arts, nothing to do with show business. You know, I was driving a soda truck on and off in New York, delivery trucks, you know. And one day I just said, I said, I'm going to L.A., I, I, I got to try to do this. And I mean, I never went to script writing school, I never went to college, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a college guy, you know. And when, I, when you look at all the chances that I took in my life, you know, uh, and I took many, many, many chances, and many of them worked out for me, but if I had to still sum up who I was, I would have to say that I was scared every moment that I was doing it. I, I really truly was. I was frightened out of my mind because, I mean, even when I said to 20th Century Fox, I, after, after I wrote Midnight Run, they were out looking, for, they said they want to give three writers a, you know, a, a directorial uh, debut. And I went into meet with Joe, Joe Roth, the president of 20th Century Fox. I said, yeah, I can direct a movie. And he said, okay, fine, you got a movie to direct. And I walked, and I said, I'm a movie director. And then I was like, <laughs> now what do I do? It's like, I mean, I had it in my head, and but I, like, I guess if I had to sum it all up, you know, in, in, with complete honesty, I was scared every moment of all of it, but the thought of not doing it was just a little more scary than the thought of doing it. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, like, so the advice to people is? Just go for it. I mean, you know, it's like, just go for it in terms of painting, in terms of like, go for it, you know? I mean, if you screw up with a painting, that's why they got the palette knife. You scrape <laughs> it out, you know? Just do it. Just do it, like Nike says. Just do it, man. How do you want to be remembered, or do you care? Well, you're assuming I'm leaving, so am I going somewhere? Hey, am yeah. I going somewhere? Hey, you know? all this interview is about to be over. Uh, how do I want to be remembered? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, not even, you know, for this stuff. I mean, look, I, I hope, look, I hope I touch people with my work, you know? I, I do, but I, I, I would prefer that the people that were close to me, I made them laugh, you know, and I made them feel, I made their life a little easier in some way. I mean, I, I, just, I mean, I love paintings looking, it's funny, like, you know, Van Gogh, Monet, they never really died in a way. They're still here, they're still touching people, they're still influencing people, but I, I swear to you, Eric, and yes, I do want my paintings to hang in, in museums. Well, and, and they have. You were, had a major show in the Butler Museum. Yeah, yeah, and they, they've got a painting now. I mean, yeah, I want the stuff to last. I'd hate to think I devoted my entire life to something and then nobody gave a damn about it down the road, but I can't control that. So I do think about it, but it's also maddening, you know, because I, 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 sometimes I see them stacked up you know, in, in the garage, and there's sometimes there's like a thousand of them just stacked up. Like, what's going to happen with all this stuff I, when I'm gone? Just ship them to me. That'd okay. be fine. You That'd got it. Fine. So, but, George, yes. um, there's a knock on your door, um, and you open the door, and it's Edward Redfield. Oh, yeah. And you get to sit down for a beer. Mm -hmm. What are you going to ask him? What would I ask Edward Redfield? Uh, I'd ask him why. Because I know a lot about his life. I, I read his book, you know, I read a lot of, the, he never wrote a specific book, but I read a lot, well, there's been a lot of books written about him. I read them. He's a very interesting guy. I see sort of parallels in my life with him, which is my, in terms of personalities. Uh, he could be very gregarious and very reclusive all at once. I have, definitely have that. You know, it's like, what was the old joke? I love people, but it's, what is it? I love mankind, but it's the people I can't stand. You know, I, I have a little bit of that in me, you know. You know, Redfield gave a great color lesson, which is, um, it, it almost changed, it, to say it changed my life is, 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 is a bit extreme, but it's funny, I, 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 when I read the passage in a book, I, it was based on a letter he wrote to Daniel, Gar Daniel Garber, who was another brilliant, Pennsylvania painter, and they were writing letters back and forth, and I was reading these letters in the book. And I called up David LaFell, I said, David, is this like the greatest color lesson you're ever going to read? He goes, read it to me, George. So I said, so it said, Redfield says, painting in my field today, uh, painting, because he had a farmhouse in Pennsylvania. He said, uh, looking at my sheep, uh, he said, with all the greens, my sheep appear pink. 
And then he, the next letter was in the fall. He said, painting, painting a farmhouse again today with all the red leaves, my sheep appear green. So Redfield knew, which I incorporate in all of my work, Redfield knew that the eye craves the compliment at all times, which is what I'll talk about in the, in the demonstration. Even if you don't see it, it's there. It's how the, the, the cones and the eyeball work. They, 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 made, they did experiments with people where they would literally put people in an all red room and they didn't know what color it was because there was no green because the eye only sees color based on okay, that's yellow because that's blue, I mean, it, 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 or that's violet, yellow and violet. But the, the eye reads color by compliments, by comparison. So if it's just one color, you, you have a very difficult time discerning what it is. So that's part of, that's the basis of a lot of how I paint, you know. Is, really, uh, everything in painting is about comparison, isn't it? It is, sure. It's about, you know, big to small, it's about dark to light. It's about chroma to gray. Yeah. It's 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 Edge. all about comparison. Edges, Edges. soft values. Hard. How do you pick out a value? Well, I mean, it's like no val. Nothing is intrinsically anything until it's compared to something else. I mean, yes, black is black and white is white, but but everything that falls in between, you know, you has to, it, you only can read it because of what it's next to, you know. So that's a hard edge because that's a soft edge. That's that's warm because that's cool. I mean, a lot of times, like uh, um, like let's say grays, you know, like if you mix a gray, it, it could be green in one color of universe, green in one color universe, and purple in another color universe just by what's next to it. Right. So. Well, this has been a pleasure. Great, me too. I, I'm honored that you would spend time with us, and, and I'm honored that you would do this video. No, I'm so honored to do it. I really am. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, and I've done a couple of books now. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, I would pick these books up. They, they would change my life. And I, the idea that I could pass along all the stuff that I've learned and now, you know, hand it off to somebody else makes me very, very happy. It means I didn't waste all my time. <laughs> That guy makes me laugh. That's George Gallo from the video Impressionistic Landscape Painting. And you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Thanks for watching. The essence of Impressionism is to violate all the rules of painting by stripping away the true representation of the objects or people portrayed you are left with the artist's emotional view of the subject, the artist's impression. When you view impressionistic paintings, you're looking at the subject through the eyes of the artist. You don't simply see a person or a place. You see the expressions of Renoir, the brushstrokes of Monet, the implications of Van Gogh, the textures of Manet, now, you can unlock the secret to Impressionistic Landscape Painting with a new video course, Impressionistic Landscape Painting with George Gallo. Hollywood film director and screenwriter George Gallo is an award-winning painter, author, and master of Impressionism. His goal is to help everyone learn and understand how to paint Impressionism. I'm going to try to get you guys to think like a painter. Think like a painter. What I mean by that is, is to, how to transform what you're seeing and break it down into paint. Watch George Gallo create a gorgeous impressionistic landscape, showing you every step of creating textures, color, light, layers, and more, and providing valuable and easy to follow instructions. You can't paint in a way that you're not yourself. So obviously, you may have put together by now that I'm a large, gregarious person. I can be loud, so I'm going to paint in that fashion because that's who I am. I have to surrender to what I am. You know, you can't pretend to be something you're not. So you are what you are. So you have to paint towards that. You know, otherwise you're fighting something your whole life. You'll learn to create impressionistic landscape paintings that invoke emotions, visual connections, and a sense of place. How to create color harmony, balance the composition, and master the brushstrokes that make an impressionistic painting come alive. How to use atmospheric perspective to create a sense of depth and much more. 
whether you've been painting for 50 years or just starting out. Don't miss your chance to discover how to create your own Impressionistic paintings. Impressionistic Landscape Painting with George Gallo is now available on video.